So today we're very fortunate um, to have uh, Professor Nicholas Tackett, who is from the history department here on the campus, an associate professor here in the uh, Department of History, and he actually works in historic China and works with material things in historic China, which is great. Primarily tomb belongings, and I guess we'll be getting some of that today, but I want to mention two books he just told me about that you might find very interesting uh, that he's published. The first one in 2014 is called The Destruction of Medieval Chinese Aristocracy, kind of a nice title, um, on um, tomb um, epitaphs. And his more recent book that's out next month, uh, called The Origins of the Chinese Nation, which takes, which is 11th century. So um, he's uh, using a lot of material, uh, materiality in his uh, historical work. So we're really pleased to have him here, a new affiliate uh, of our group as well. So please welcome Professor Tackett. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to um, be here. Um, so <clears throat> what I am going to talk about today is um, 11th century um, China. And, in, uh, the, and here is a, a map to get us started. Uh, during the 11th century, um, East Asia, and specifically Northeast Asia, was divided up among two uh, major uh, empires. There was the Song Empire to the south, and then the Liao Empire, which was founded by Khitans from the Eurasian steppe uh, to the north. The boundary dividing these two empires, the political boundary, was set at a somewhat unusual uh, location. Um, it it um, crossed the North China Plain, as suggested here, um, which was, again, one can think of this as an uh, unusual geopolitical uh, arrangement where what one might think of as a natural cultural zone, the North China Plain, was split in two between these two empires. Um, in later times, according to, from the perspective of Chinese historians writing in the Ming Dynasty and later, um, and even already by the 13th century, um, they were arguing that this region of the, su the southernmost part of the Liao uh, Empire should have been part of the Song Empire. It was naturally Chinese and should not have been part of a Khitan Empire. This region was referred to as the 16 prefectures. It more or less span this region here. Um, the eastern part of these 16 prefectures is referred to as Yen, um, and this will come up in, the, in, in my talk, uh, and so it's worth remembering that. So Yen was a region that was controlled by the, the Khitan Liao Empire, but in later times would be um, perceived as a region that ought to be part of a Chinese empire, um, and for example, ought to, be, ought to have been part of the Song Dynasty. So one of the questions, um, one way of, uh, one version of the question I want to ask today is essentially um, how did the political boundary as well as some sort of cultural boundary f further north, how are these different boundaries reflected in the uh, material culture um, of, this, uh, of this region? Um, how, did they, how did the political and cultural boundaries affect culture? Um, as reflected in uh, material culture, and specifically uh, the material culture of tombs. When considering this question, it is worth bearing in mind that not only were the Yen Mountains, not only did they constitute a um, natural cultural boundary, um, but in fact, this um, boundary was integrated into Liao ethnic policies. So there was um, concerted efforts to manage different ethnic groups within the Liao Empire. The Liao Empire, again, had been founded by Khitans from the, ethnics, uh, from the um, Eurasian steppe, um, and uh, they conceived of their empire as a multi-ethnic empire. It was um, conceived that way. Um, there are there is various uh, bits of evidence of this, but um, I I will point out that uh, it's been uh, often argued that um, on the Eurasian steppe there are um, specific um, uh, uh, it, it's common to encounter um, basically um, ethnic divisions on the steppe and for the for ethnicity to then be become part of the um, how the um, 
empires um, conceive of themselves and how they um, um, organize their um, administrations. In the case of the Khitans, it's interesting um, uh, various ways in which the, the, the Khitans portrayed themselves um, in ways not unlike the Manchus would later on. The Manchus also came from this northeastern region and would establish the last um, Chinese dynasty, the Qing dynasty, and they too um, had a very um, um, a very clear um, ethnic policy by means of which they classified the different peoples of their empire into different groups that were um, subject to different um, um, legal, uh, legal regimes. Um, and then, um, and they too, like the Khitans, made use of certain similar ethnic markers. Hair was an important um, ethnic marker. The Khitans, the male hairstyle consisted of um, two um, tufts of hair hanging from the sides. Uh, two sides of the uh, head. Um, the, the Manchus also had something similar going on. Um, they um, had the cue in the, in the back of the head. This was the male hairstyle. The difference being that the Manchus imposed their hairstyle on the entire Chinese population, whereas the Khitans um, maintained it as a um, marker of distinction. These two images here are, are line drawings um, um, that I made based on, um, on the left, a song court, song court paintings, and it's actually three different details from, so it's not a single, um, a single painting, but three different details from different um, uh, song court paintings. And on the right, one has three different uh, details from Viao uh, tomb uh, murals. So um, different ways of depicting um, Khitans and their daily life, both um, from the perspective of the Khitans themselves um, in their own um, tombs and from the perspective of the um, Song, uh, Song Chinese. And I do think it's interesting that one sees um, similarities in how the Khitans are portrayed, um, notably as um, uh, essentially um, um, uh, pastoral nomadic uh, warriors. Uh, they, you, you can see them with their um, horses and with their um, uh, bows and, and arrows. Um, one also sees um, evidence of their nomadic um, uh, lifestyles, their um, houses on wheels with the camels um, to um, pull them around. And then there's also an interesting element of these depictions of the um, of the um, of Khitan life, which consists of these um, large um, uh, metal cauldrons that are boiling large chunks of meat. This is also an element that one um, encounters in a, num in a number of different representations of Khitan um, life, um, uh, that is life on the steppe from, the, the, from this uh, particular way of, of, of portraying it. And it's interesting, again, that there is this focus on that, um, those um, uh, uh, recurrent uh, elements. And I'll come back to that in uh, just a second. Now, Ways in which there are various ways in which it's um, clear that the um, Liao Empire um, was organized on these ethnic lines. Um, so there were four basic people included in the empire. There were the Khitans, there were um, Han, and these were the ethnic Chinese. Um, there were also Parhe and Xi, so four different groups. And one encounters them throughout um, the um, um, documents uh, pertaining to the organization of the, um, of the Liao um, state. And for example, one finds lots of official titles or names of bureaus that make reference to multiple, to two, two or more different people. So you have, for example, the chief administration office of the Han and Parhe peoples of the Chongda um, Ordo. So that's the, uh, 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 a basic um, <coughs> administrative unit. But again, there's, what's interesting is and what I want to um, uh, point out and highlight is that um, different people were, were part of this empire. They were conceived, the empire was conceived as being composed of multiple different people and what encounters that um, in, in all over the place in descriptions of the um, Liao administration. It was also true that this meant from the, uh, one of the reasons for doing this is that the Liao um, understood that different people were managed in different ways. Most ob the most obvious distinction was gonna be between the Chinese um, who were thought of as agriculturalists and the um, steppe 
um, and the Khitans who were thought of as, nom as pastoral nomads and um, relied on an entirely different economy. Um, the way it was put in the Liao, in the history of Liao, was that the Liao ought to use national institutions, meaning Khitan institutions, to govern, govern the Khitans, and then Han institutions, meaning Chinese institutions, in treating uh, the Han people. So there was a sense of uh, that, that the, this was necessary, um, a necessary um, um, element of successfully um, ruling this multi-ethnic empire was to um, break up the administration into um, separate units for dealing with um, different people. Um, there's other places in which one encounters um, uh, the, um, the, this, um, um, eth the question of ethnicity um, in um, um, specifically um, um, a, a, uh, in um, a, st a state, uh, that is the things organized by the Liao state, um, um, uh, events organized by the, the Liao state. So for example, at um, diplomatic um, banquets, uh, when you had uh, Song officials in Liao territory, Song diplomats in Liao territory, they would have banquets every evening. And it's interesting that the de description of the banquets seem to be a deliberate, um, involve a deliberate effort to perform um, ethnicity um, according to certain um, preconceived um, ethnic um, uh, um, categories. Um, and so what's, what I find striking about this particular description of the ban banquet from a uh, written by a Song um, envoy of the early 11th century is that in fact there were very large chunks of meat that were served to the um, uh, uh, Song envoy. Um, the Song would not eat um, these large chunks of meat because they can't, they eat with chopsticks, they don't eat with um, their hands. This is important and they, they stuck to that and therefore the, um, <coughs> the, the Khitans had to assign them pages who would cut the meat into smaller pieces so that they could eat them with chopsticks. So from you know, the way I read this is that basically there's a recognition that um, <coughs> there are these different eating practices, that these are um, ethnic markers, these are ways of distinguishing the Khitans from the Chinese, and this is um, deliberately then um, um, acted out in these um, diplomatic um, uh, banquets um, organized by the Liao state. Um, <clears throat> now, besides um, classifying people into different groups, the Liao also um, um, reorganized the um, ethnic geography of um, Northeast Asia. Um, and, uh, and this was directly linked to the fact that they were using different um, administrations, different um, institutions for managing um, Han Chinese versus uh, Khitans. Um, and so what they did, it, it is um, certainly um, indicated in the sources, is that they did relocate people around. There's lots of accounts of um, forcible migrations to move different groups of people around the empire. Um, and by this means, um, organizing the um, ethnic geography in a way that, was, that made more sense from the perspective of the institutions. As a result, um, the Song envoys themselves noticed this um, as they were traveling, and specifically they noticed that the region of Yan was inhabited by Chinese. Um, and so, you know, one envoy points out that the residents of Yan customarily all wear Han clothing. Another one um, points out that south of the Yan Mountains, that is the region of Yan, the clothing and language are all according to old customs, that is, um, it's the Chinese language, Chinese clothing, this is what the people are speaking and wearing. Um, and then another envoy in a, in a poem writes um, that the frontier of Yen ends at Gubei Pass, a pass that, that through the Yen Mountains to the north of the North China Plain, beyond which the mountains dissipate into numerous flat fields. And here you have Xi people building grass huts, you have Khitan horse um, carts, and so um, basically a description of a changing cultural ecology um, as soon as you get past the mountains to the north of the North China Plain. So again, the point of all this then is to um, emphasize that there was a political boundary here, but there was a cultural and ethnic boundary further north, a cultural <laughs> ethnic boundary that, you know, in some sense uh, may, be, may have been a natural divide insofar as it divided um, the agriculturally rich North China Plain 
from the regions further north. But um, the important point to make is that the um, Liao state was actively involved in reinforcing this um, boundary such that there really was a clear ethnic divide when the um, Liao um, diplomats um, passed through this region. So what I was um, then interested in doing um, was to really try to analyze um, and, and examine how this political boundary and this cultural boundary then had an impact on culture. And I, to um, um, study culture, I used, I, I focused on material culture and, and to be more precise, the material um, culture of tombs. Um, I put together a um, database which um, is, can, can be downloaded um, from uh, my website. Um, a database that actually spans the earlier Tang Dynasty, so it covers the, roughly the 7th through the 13th century, but lots of the tombs are from the 11th century, the period in question um, uh, that I'm talking about uh, today. Um, so um, lots of, it's based, the, the database was based on, basically I went through um, all of the published um, archaeological reports I could find going back to the 1950s. I stopped about two, uh, 2010, um, but there were lots of um, archaeological reports um, in all sorts of different um, uh, publications. Most were in archaeological, in the Chinese archaeological journals, but there were also a certain number of reports published as um, separate uh, volumes. Um, so about 1,700 tombs. And in the um, database, I included um, uh, data on uh, tomb contents, so mostly various um, grave goods, um, mural motifs. There are not a lot of uh, murals that survive from these tombs, but there's enough to um, um, draw um, interesting conclusions um, looking for um, regional patterns. Um, I also included um, uh, data on um, architecture, so the layout, that the shape of the tomb, of the floor plan of the tomb, and certain other specific um, um, elements that um, occur recurrently in tombs of this period. And then, of course, um, latitude and longitude coordinates, which is of obviously essential for uh, mapping these tombs. The latitude and longitude coordinates, I, I estimate, are um, are correct to a um, within about five miles. Um, so it's good for making large maps, but not for actually finding a tomb um, in, the, in the field. Um, I, I got the coordinates. Lar a lot of these um, reports simply have a description, a textual description of the place. So then you have to go, go to a map, um, track down this place, um, and then um, find the latitude and longitude coordinates and enter it into the database. So it took quite a bit of time to put this together. Um, now, based on this database, um, I actually did more than one study. I had an earlier study where I was looking for change between the Tang and the Song, and this was um, related to an entirely different question. Um, but um, pertinent to the question um, of that, that I'm discussing today has to do with trying to reconstruct um, different um, cultural um, repertoires that one could then um, um, claim this is identifies Khitan tombs, this identifies um, this set of features identifies um, Chinese tombs. And it actually took quite a bit of work. There was already some um, Chinese archaeologists who had um, produced some lists of differences between these two types of tombs. So that was a good starting point. But then I had to do it really on an empirical basis, look for what are the sets of objects that, and, or tomb features that tend to cluster together. Um, and it was um, ultimately possible to come up with a list of um, uh, features that um, by and large are useful for distinguishing these two types of tombs. And the differences are actually pretty striking. So it's not, we're not talking about subtle differences in the patterns on um, pottery. We're talking about pretty radical differences in terms of tomb content. To give you some example, um, a lot of the Chinese type tombs, basically they were organized um, around some sort of afterlife banquet. Um, it's very clear that the tomb was the site of an afterlife banquet. This actually um, ties in, inter in interesting ways to um, the, the sorts of, um, of rituals performed um, on behalf of the deceased uh, um, after, after death, um, rituals where food is offered to the spirit of the deceased. Um, and a lot of the way in which um, uh, 
the um, food is positioned relative to either the, the, the deceased in the tomb or the, um, or the ancestral tablet that is above ground um, suggests a common pattern. You basically lay out the food in front of the deceased um, and the deceased is imagined to, to consume it and um, basically to um, remain content. Um, this was important from the Chinese perspective because basically you want the uh, spirit to stay in the tomb and not go anywhere else. So you have this nice um, afterlife banquet. In uh, Chinese tombs, this appears in a, in a number of different ways. Very often you have the mural itself depicting a banquet. Um, and it's interesting that um, there's this sort of virtual reality element to the tombs because the, um, there's a, a common um, masonry technique where the um, bricks actually project out of the wall of the tomb. So you can make out a chair and a table. Um, the chair and the table are often empty. Um, there's not, no one painted. We can see a servant behind, but the chair itself is empty. This is where the deceased presumably would sit. Um, and then you have the um, food laid out on the table um, in the mural. And there's often interesting interactions between the mural and the space of the tomb itself. One also finds these, um, um, there, there'll be these um, painted, for example, these um, painted um, um, lamps where, where you put a candle on top and then there'll be a brick um, sticking out of the wall and an actual bowl will have been placed there that presumably contained um, a, ca a burning candle when the, when the tomb was um, sealed. Uh, so that, again, there's both this um, depiction of an afterlife banquet and, um, and this um, um, way in which the, the, tomb, the, the walls of the tomb are integrated into the content of the tomb um, such that one can imagine that the deceased is enjoying the banquet as in sort of a, a virtual way. By contrast, Khitan tombs contain very different sorts of objects and objects not surprisingly associated with um, pastoral nomadic um, uh, warriors. You have lots of weapons in tombs. You do not have weapons in the Chinese tombs. Also lots of horse equipment. So depicted here is a, um, what remains of a wood saddle, um, also a, a metal stirrup, and then some horse bells. Um, and so all of these are associated either with horses or, um, or um, weaponry. Um, again, none of this is typically found in a Chinese type tomb. And there's other features as well, and I won't go through, through all of them, but I do want to suggest that there are radical differences. It's not subtle um, that these different types of tombs. Um, I um, <clears throat> made some efforts to um, look basically for patterns um, to, to um, establish that there was um, a, a particular patterns of clustering in terms of different sets of, of objects. So basically, um, just look, this table simply um, cross tabulates um, tombs, what, what percentage of tombs contains both, um, both objects um, at once. And on the basis of this, I think one can see pretty clearly two basic types of tombs. Upper left would be the Khitan tombs, lower right would be the Chinese type tombs. And then um, uh, it's important to note that there are some, there's a set of objects that does um, commonly occur in um, both types of tombs. Um, now when one looks at these what one might call hybrid tombs that contains um, both of these um, types of objects, one finds um, an interesting um, result which is that these tombs often will um, group, uh, so the, the specific um, objects in question were a set of um, basically Chinese um, uh, of, of ceramic goods. So these wine vessels, spittoons, vessels with lotus patterns, and also this thing referred to by the Chinese archaeologists as chicken thigh bottles because they're apparently shaped like chicken thighs, which if you, in, if you um, deal with chi chickens, you probably <laughs> recognize that right away. Um, in any case, these are um, a, a set of ceramics that in these um, diagrams I'm referring to as Chinese ceramics. Um, so when you have these tombs that look primarily with primarily the Khitan type features, but that also include um, what I'm uh, referring to as Chinese type ceramics, it is interesting that the Chinese ceramics tend to be grouped separately within the tomb. Um, it seems to me that that's, that indicates that at least the, um, uh, peop uh, the people um, building these tombs conceived of this set of objects as a separate 
um, set of a, a separate um, a set of things. It's also interesting that often the Chinese type ceramics show up basically in front of the um, body of the deceased, which is also where you find the ceramics um, laid out on a table in front of the coffin in the Chinese type tomb. So it suggests that this, um, this, this type of hybrid tomb does in fact um, uh, uh, integrate um, sort of a conscious um, effort to um, distinguish these, these two types, which I think um, suggests that the um, uh, in the Liao territory, they were aware of these as separate um, um, cultural um, components. Okay, so <clears throat> then one can map these different um, uh, tombs out. Um, and so again, looking at the map with the political boundary here uh, between the Song and the Liao state, here I have the, the red circles indicate um, Kitan type tombs, the ch uh, black um, dots. Um, indicate Chinese type tombs and then those X's are those um, hybrid type tombs and it is I think quite striking that basically you will not have uh, one archaeologists have not found any Kitan type tombs south of the Yen mountains um, there are some hybrid tombs right in the um, along this kind of line um, sep separating the North China Plain from the region um, beyond but most of the tombs south of the Yen mountains are um, of the Chinese type so once one has classified these tombs in, these, in this particular way, there is a clear um, cultural um, divide and a cultural divide that is not at, um, does, not, um, um, does not map onto the political um, boundary and this is um, of course um, significant. There are a few interesting exceptions um, and you know, it's hard to tell what the story is behind some of these exceptions. Um, but it has been noted by um, archaeologists working in other periods that there was, they've often found some um, commonalities in the material culture around the Bohai Sea. And one could argue, in fact, that it's not necessarily more difficult um, to travel between here and here than to get to the end of the um, Shandong Peninsula from the, um, um, from the Chinese uh, interior. Okay, now, the way in which the Chinese interpreted this um, uh, cultural um, uh, uh, geography was to um, argue um, already beginning in the 11th century, and this is more apparent in later times, that this, these people here are Chinese. And indeed, in, um, uh, according to the way that the Liao Empire was classifying people, these were Han people. And so it was understood that they um, shared a culture with the people um, south of the border. Um, the Chinese who saw themselves in the Song Dynasty basically as having a mono-ethnic empire, an empire populated by Han Chinese. Um, anyone who was not Han Chinese was you know, an, a, a stranger, an outsider, and was thought of in those terms. From their perspective then, they were talking about the people of this Yen region as um, their brethren. Um, and there's um, interesting examples of this. This is a, um, a text, um, basically it's, a, um, it's a, a funerary epitaph. It comes from a funerary epitaph from, um, of a, a, a prominent Song minister. Um, and he is meeting a, um, a Kitan or a Liao um, official, a Liao diplomat who has come um, to visit the Song court. This Liao diplomat, however, is an ethnic um, Han, is a, is a Han um, uh, Chinese. Um, and in this uh, conversation that may or may not be imagined, this, um, this um, uh, envoy is talking to the uh, uh, Song diplomat. He says, he, he says I, um, Liao Liaofu, so Liao Liaofu again, he's the, the, the Liao um, diplomat. I am a man from Yen. So he is um, claiming to be from this region of Yen that is populated by Han Chinese. Along with the officials of the southern court, that is the Song Dynasty, we were originally all one family. And I think this um, argument about being all one family is, is critical because it is indeed suggesting that they have, share a common descent. And so um, it's not just understood as being a common culture, but a common culture that is tied to a common descent. Whether it's the Liao Liaofu who was thinking this, or whether it was the Song, um, uh, his, um, 
the, the song guy who he was talking to, who was interpreting what he said in this way, or whether this entire conversation was imagined by um, the author um, of this uh, epitaph, um, it's, it's nevertheless important that you have in these um, Chinese, in these song Chinese texts, this, um, the articulation of this idea that the people of Yen um, shared a common descent with um, the people of uh, Song. And so this is how the, the Song Chinese were interpreting this um, cultural commonality with, um, that is um, uh, um, evident in uh, the material um, uh, record. However, it is nevertheless um, worth asking, and I, and I will just say a few words about this now, um, to what extent um, one can nevertheless detect differences in um, tombs between south of the political border and north of the political border. And by and large, I find that the differences are more subtle um, and one can find differences and one can think about the implications of these differences, um, but they, what they don't do is reflect an entirely different way of conceiving of the afterlife. So the, the much more radical um, uh, cultural divide, it seems to me, is between um, the um, North China Plain and the regions north of the Yan Mountains. One interesting um, difference has to do with scissors. Um, so basically, for some reason or another, you f one finds scissors in tombs. Um, they seem to have a symbolic significance in Chinese tombs, um, and it's, there's debate on, on what it actually signified. Um, but then they, are f they may um, actually, they, they're often found in Khitan tombs, um, basically uh, along with other metal tools. So they're part of some kind of tool kit in the, um, in the, in the Khitan tombs. One interesting <clears throat> pattern is basically you find scissors either painted on murals or actually um, in relief um, on the walls in the Song Dynasty Chinese tombs. In the Liao Chinese tombs, that is the tombs, Liao tombs south of the Yan Mountains, one often finds scissors that are made of ceramic, so they're equally non-functional. Um, and it, it, you know, it seems to me that it goes along with this general idea that lots of the stuff in Chinese tombs works through some sort of uh, virtual um, reality. It's not the, you don't need the actual functional object for it to do what it needs to do. And then finally, when you get into the Khitan type tombs, that's when you find actual metal scissors that are presumably uh, functional. Another um, interesting difference between, um, th that suggests um, uh, um, a, a dis, uh, 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 some sort of impact of the political boundary involves um, a cremation uh, burial. Um, and basically what's, um, what sort of surprised me ultimately was that um, the, by far the most um, uh, uh, frequent, where one finds a cremation burial most frequently is in the Liao Chinese um, um, region, so the region between the political boundary and the cultural boundary. Further north, there are cremation burials, but they're not the majority. They're found occasionally. And further south, they're actually found very rarely in um, Song territory. There's good reason to believe, so the cremation burials in um, East Asia, it is, a, um, it is typically seen as an as a, um, indicator of Buddhism, basically. So Buddhists, um, cremate their dead, and that's it. Um, but what's interesting is that really everyone um, in this um, region was practicing Buddhism to various degrees. We know that Buddhism was widespread. Um, there were Buddhist temples all over Song China. And then throughout Liao t territory, we, one knows that the Khitan state sponsored these huge Buddhist um, rituals. There's an inscription for a deceased um, Khitan princess that says that um, the, the name of Buddha was, um, was um, or, or Ami, Ami um, Taba was um, um, uttered something like three million times at the, at the person's um, funeral. So it was a major, and with something like you know, 999 monks were involved or something like that. It was a huge ritual, a huge Buddhist ritual um, that was sponsored by the state. Um, and so what this, I think, um, um, demonstrates is not um, that um, Buddhism only existed in this region as it would often be read by Chinese archeologists who, um, who really see this as a kind of the stereotypic uh, marker of Buddhist practice. But in fact, that um, Buddhist was, Buddhist, um, Buddhism was practiced in different ways in these different regions. There were regulations that were um, intended to discourage cremation in Song China. 
Um, and so these seem to have had an impact. Um, there were no such regulations in Liao territory, so cremation burial was common. And then among um, uh, the ways, the, the um, references to Buddhism that one finds in Kitan type tombs are of um, ultimately a different nature. Um, they're not, they don't come in the form of cremation and um, I'm not 100% <clears throat> sure of this um, interpretation, but I found that there's in Kitan um, type tombs, there's a lot of um, these little chimes that were um, um, placed on the sides of coffins. Um, and I actually, I have a, I'll just go ahead and show this slide now. But basically you had a lot of the um, uh, coffins were uh, made of wood and they were sort of, one could um, argue, in the shape of a temple. There was a doorway entering there. Um, and I think that the chimes are um, in fact um, Buddhist um, symbols. Um, they show up in different places within Khitan tombs. And uh, the reason I think it's an effective um, um, reference to Buddhism is that you have the chimes on the sides of Buddhist pagodas and when you are in this, in the, in the steppe, um, and so this is actually a Liao era a pagoda, a pagoda that dates to the 11th century, and you do hear the chimes from far away. So, um, you know, this is a sound that is associated with pagodas that is then, one would imagine, associated with Buddhism. This model pagoda that was found in the um, crypt um, underneath a pagoda in Liao territory, it's interesting that one of the most prominent elements of this object are the chimes um, hanging off the sides, suggesting again that this was something that was clearly associated with pagodas and with Buddhism. And so to the extent that these objects are frequently found in Khitan type tombs, this may be um, the way in which Buddhism is expressed in um, Liao tombs. But again, going back to this um, um, map, it's interesting that one finds a difference both um, um, where the political border makes a difference and this um, cultural border further north makes a difference. And one last little <coughs> distinction that's kind of um, uh, um, only semi-serious, but because there's only some data to suggest this, but if you look at whether or not a tomb murals have cats or dogs in them, it is interesting that in the Song metropolitan region one only finds cats in the um, steppe region, one only finds dogs and they tend to be hunting dogs. And then there's a little bit of both in this region here, but there's quite a few dogs in the Liao controlled part of um, China, but they tend to be these smaller um, kind of lap dog types, um, which are, in fact, some of them look kind of like Pekingese, um, not, um, not too surprisingly, I guess, because in, indeed Pekingese are very common in Beijing today. So, and, and Beijing, by the way, is, uh, modern day Beijing is right here, so this is the, the region of, of Beijing. But again, here once more is, is one little bit of evidence of where the political boundary makes a difference. One can notice some um, subtle distinctions between tombs north and south of the, of the, of the political boundary, but all, the cultural boundary is also significant, and I, still, and I think overall um, the, um, the change in the material culture north and south of the cultural boundary is in fact much more striking um, than uh, is the political boundary. I'll stop here and, um, be, and I'm happy to take questions. Do those 
big chunk. I mean, I feel like when you started to talk with, there's kind of a natural cultural area going on here, right? And I started to think, what makes a natural cultural area for both a historian and an archaeologist? And maybe some of it has to do with where those big chunks of meat are coming from and how people think about their, their natural world as being mobilized in these performances of food and, and identity. So those big chunks of meat, you listed a bunch of stuff like horse, camel, and other, you know, some of it was venison, but some of it was a gruel, you know. It, is that potentially something that as a zooarchaeologist I'd say, aha, you know, there's a, a bunch of labor going into making camel gruel, right? And, and, and maybe that has something to do with where those folks who are invested in that labor live. Right, their their familiarity with the bodies of these animals to be able to produce that grill is really different than somebody who couldn't perform that. Yeah, I mean the the way I um, the way I read this is that simply there's a couple of different things going on here. So from the Chinese side, basically um, eating small eating with chopsticks is a marker of being civilized, and this shows up in texts that you know the barbarians they don't eat with chopsticks. So there's that element going on there. Um, and then from the step side, you know, it's interesting that they clearly accept this, this idea that they don't eat with chopsticks, but they don't see it presumably in the same way that the Chinese do as yes, with barbarians who have to get mastered the skill of chopsticks and therefore we can't eat with them. And you know, clearly they're not thinking of it in that way. But this would be presumably a traditional way of eating. <coughs> You know, they have much more, um, on the step, much more meat-based diets. Um, they, um, you know, it's basically meat and milk. This is the, the core of the diet. Even if you go to Mongolia today, in Ulaanbaatar, mm -hmm. you know, you can buy carrots, but they're pretty expensive. Um, so, so distance from that knowledge of bodies and ability to, to recognize it because, you know, that little piece, big one of chocolate. So, so I, I think it originates as different diets that they pick up on, they notice that they're eating different kinds of food and it becomes an ethnic marker. It's, you know, ethnic markers are going to be something that is relatively obvious and this is something that they pick up on and it becomes symbolically very significant as a marker of a distinction between Chinese and, and um, Tetons or steppe people uh, more generally. Um, the fact that you have these cauldrons depicted both on the Chinese paintings and on the Kitan paintings, you know, they show up all over the place. So on the, in these um, depictions, which suggests, again, this was significant. They're telling you this is a scene of life on the stem, um, and this is a key element. And then having it performed in the banquet suggests, once again, that the, 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 the Kitans are very aware that this is, um, this is what distinguishes them from the Chinese. They would never serve a banquet with little pieces of meat. That would be just selling out to the Chinese. They would do their thing and make the Chinese have to wait until it gets cut. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Is there any chance that these scissors could have been used for cutting meat? Is there, I mean, you say that you're, um, you, you're not entirely sure what the scissors refer to, and then everything else in the tomb tends to be related to food consumption. Well, I would not say that everything is um, related to food consumption. That's one element of what, what, what one finds. Um, I would say that in the Kitan tombs, you have with these, you know, these weapons um, and, um, and then horse equipment, um, which I think is um, you know, clearly um, not surprising if they are um, pastoral um, nomads. And it's hard to tell whether it's a conscious thing. We're going to put this in our tomb so people know that we're Kitans, or if it's more, they have a vision of the afterlife where they need what they needed in, 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 in life, in the afterlife. They need the same things, otherwise it will be a problem. Um, the, the tools, basically, there's just a lot of different tools, and a lot of them are like, they're described by the archaeologists as wood cutting tools, and I don't know if the archaeologists know what they're actually going to use for, if they just see these metal things. But there seems to be a lot of different kinds of equipment. Well, maybe they are used to cut meat, but it's a, it's a very um, um, interesting um, proposal. And you know, I, I think when you think of it as sort of the equipment you carry around on your horse um, as you do your seasonal migrations, and so these are 
essentials in some way or another. I wouldn't along on that. The, you pointed out the Chinese accoutrement, uh, food accoutrement in the northern tombs, of, and you talked about the horse tool orientation. Did the northern tombs not have their own food ways depicted? at all in their tombs, in the pure ones, the not Chinese ceramic northern tombs? Well, the, um, so there would be the Biao, the Biao murals would be, uh, these would be the tomb, Kitan tombs, and often the tombs in Biao territory, the murals were the, the largest of all the tombs, and those tended to be for basically what one might think of as Kitan nobility. They often had lots of Food-related objects, or um, just there not, equipment? Yeah, there, were not, there was not actual food. There were, um, there were often animal sacrif sacrificed animals, and unclear to me what that, what that was. Um, but not an equivalent to what you see with the, what you call the Chinese ceramics. Yes, yeah, so you don't have the actual it food. Isn't the food. Chinese ceramics are not replacing uh, the northern food accoutrement. Yeah, I mean, it's impossible that they would have served that that function in those tombs that had that, but most of the Kitan tombs that didn't have that. Right, so there wasn't an equivalent Kitan right. Right. Uh, banquet. Yeah. I, 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 I just imagine that, well, in the afterlife, they're just going to have to go hunt, hunt for themselves and use their tools within the tombs. But it was not, it was not being represented on the way out. That's a pretty major difference. I'm really excited to hear about this part of your research that you started to talk about before. And, uh, and in particular, you know, as a person who's interested in these questions of construing ethnicity in the later imperial period, especially the Manchu period, I'm also you know, uh, interested in this question of, of the naturalization of this particular border, the northern border, uh, recently, Western borders, right? And the Shisha Kingdom and the Kubo, I think, or the Tibetan Kingdom to the, to the south, uh, southwest. And, and so, you know, particularly in the markers of Buddhism, right? And so it's interesting to me to see that, that strip where the cremations were most prevalent was really just to the east of the Shisha Buddhist Kingdom, right? Um, and also, I, I just wanted to mention that those, those models of the pagodas and the palaces with the chimes on them remind me a lot of uh, uh, the models of palaces used in Buddhist meditation, right? Of which mandalas are uh, the two-dimensional representation. And, and even to, in the Manchu period, you have the three-dimensional representation of palaces also uh, for, for Buddhist meditation that look so much like uh, the image that you presented. So yeah, I just wanted to ask you about how this northern border was construed differently, uh, right? The peoples and the territory of this northern, northern border vis-a-vis -vis the, the western. Yeah, so I guess um, there's a, a lot of points I could make um, about this. You know, in general, the stuff on Buddhism, I, I did very little with Buddhism other than to notice these zones, and I do think this is an interesting period that people who study Buddhism The, I should point out that one of the reasons we don't see anything this way is because my um, data sample does not include that region. This is basically the western border of the stuff in my database. So um, when you mentioned the Shishia kingdom over there, I actually don't know if, um, if there was cremation there or not. I'm not sure. um, regarding the, um, this, um, to what extent this was a border that was conceived of as being um, distinct. Um, my own sense is that it was not necessarily thought of in that way at that time. But what's interesting, what's important about this border is that there were lots of envoys crossing the border in the 11th century. And in fact, um, I don't have any of the, the data here because it really concerns a different, um, a different talk. But um, the um, envoys, 
if they traveled from some, some um, basically the Song political elite traveled to Liao in huge numbers um, over the course of the 11th century, such that um, when I did some statistics, I found that um, over 50% of the people meeting with the emperor on a daily basis, um, basically devising state policy, had previously um, traveled to the Liao capital and back on an on embassy mission. And this means that they're all familiar, there's a general familiarity with this border, and there's not the same familiarity with other borders. And so this gives this a special significance in um, Song and Yes? So um, you talked if you take into account uh, your inscriptions, I can't remember anything about the scripts or whatever, um, are they in different scripts and in different languages, and how does that evidence from tombs graph on to the other uh, uh, like Right, so, um, yeah, so I, I certainly tried to do things with tomb epitaphs um, mm -hmm. regarding this project. My first book, right. I made use of thousands yeah. of them, so I was looking for something to do with them. Um, unfortunately, they're not um, as prevalent as oh. in the earlier period in the Tang Dynasty. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a lot of these tombs don't have epitaphs, which is a problem. Um, but um, among the ones that do, it's usually the, um, the Chinese tombs will have them in Chinese. Um, and then there are a certain number of tombs written, uh, the inscriptions written in Kitan. And Kitan basically is someone who doesn't know Chinese, looks like Chinese. And if you do know Chinese, you might first think it looks like Chinese, and then you realize, wait, I can't read any of these characters. So it looks a lot like Chinese, but it's not, the language has not been entirely deciphered, which is a problem. So there are, you know, I don't read Kitan, but I've read, I've looked at Chinese translations, and they tend to be about 10% translated, so one knows very little about the content of those inscriptions. I certainly think that the, Ki the Kitan script in the, um, you know, in the historical records, it's clear that the Kitan script was devised in the middle of the 10th century by one of the first emperors because um, he thought we need our own language and our own written language, which was clearly significant. Yeah. as a kind of establishing the legitimacy of, the, of this regime. Um, and in fact, all the successor um, dynasties that controlled China but that had origins in the north also devised um, languages, devised scripts. The Mongols devised the script. The Manchus devised the scripts and all made use of the scripts. And this was clearly important. Unfortunately, they can't really be read. Um, I tried. Um, it seemed like possibly you could make the argument that inscriptions in um, Kitan tend, you know, there are going to be biographies of the deceased um, that basically praises the deceased for being the best possible person. Um, but in the um, Kitan, it seemed based on the translations that the person was being um, sort of classified on the basis of descent in a, in a very clear way of what tribe did they belong to. So this is sort of the way in which they were um, um, positioned mm -hmm. at the very beginning of the inscription, whereas in the Chinese one, it will always start with this person is from this such and such a place. Um, mm -hmm. So um, with the, more of the emphasis on kind of the defining characteristics is based on their place of origin. Um, it seems to me that that's um, significant. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the arguments I was uh, making in, in my book is that the, there's more of a natural way of, fit, of classifying people um, according to um, um, in ethnic terms, whereby ethnic one means both culture and descent assumes to be mm -hmm. combined. Mm -hmm. That this is a more natural uh, thing that happens on the step. Whereas in China, there was a tendency to think that culture is partly defined by where you are. And so even the chi in the land would sort of define um, the kind of person you were. So it was rooted more in place than Thank you. There's a the great wall that was built a few centuries later, right? Uh, Could you yeah. show us where it runs approximately? Okay, so the great wall of the Ming Dynasty runs like this. Mm -hmm. And um, the and that's also the great wall. There was a wall there that was in um, um, severe decay that was had been built in the northern Qi. The Song ambassadors encountered this wall and they thought it was the great wall of the Qin dynasty that had been built um, 2,000 years or 
1,500 years earlier, they were wrong. It was not that wall. It was interesting that they thought it was because for them this was the, the wall. It was a single wall, and the wall marked the boundary between China and the region of Iran. So for them, it was significant. Not only were they noticing this cultural change, but they were counting this wall that, from their perspective, marked the natural boundary, the historical boundary of China. Um, but it's also, um, you know, it's interesting to think of um, why these different regimes built the walls along similar courses, and some of it might be historical memory, but there's also um, strategic concerns. And further west especially, it's striking that the uh, Ming Dynasty wall, as well as an earlier wall that, that was built even pre-Qin Dynasty, um, roughly tracks the um, 38 centimeter or 15 inch isohyet, which um, is often used as a way of, of um, dividing the um, region where agriculture is possible without um, um, extensive irrigation and regions beyond the limits of agriculture. So it's interesting that the wall is, does roughly track that line, suggesting that it's kind of a natural um, ecological border as well, and is recognized as such by the builders. Yes. I was, um, to go back to the last image, I was really interested in like, the cats and, and dogs, and smaller dogs, um, and the girls. And I was just wondering what, what do you think the, uh, the meaning of these symbols were for the people of the time? I mean, or is this just um, sort of coincidental that are sort of part of the background uh, sort of scenery of these murals? Or, um, I mean, did they, did they sort of fit into the larger framework of sort of cultural difference that, that, that you were drawing between, um, so perhaps are cats associated in some way with sedentary agricultural life and, and dogs with pastoral nomadism, or is there some other yeah, yeah, one could, so I think one could easily come up with an argument where, you know, hunting dogs are actually useful on the staff, um, um, and so it would be natural for them to be depicted. Um, it's less clear why um, cats are so common in uh, metropolitan uh, tombs in this period. In my book, I simply note, um, I will leave it to the readers. It's a hard to draw a conclusion on what this means. But it should be noted that in these murals in the Song Dynasty, you know, the different walls of the tomb depict rooms, different rooms, and so it is part of a domestic scene, um, and often it's part of these murals that have these elements projecting out, so you'll have one um, face that has, you know, have a, a, a wash basin and a, and a clothing rack, so it's where you wash clothes or wash your face, um, then there'll be a wall with the, the um, banquet scene, so there's different rooms with different um, elements, and these cats are part of this domestic scene, so you know, it seems to me that they would be an animal that would be enjoyed by the deceased after after death. Yes. Baby cats are important when there's a problem with mice. Yeah, it's definitely true that. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the so, thesis for why they're domesticated. Yeah. Go along with agriculture. But the but the thing is, is that with um, so in you know peasants households in, in rural China, there's definitely people like to have their because the cats will eat the mice that would otherwise eat their grain supply, so it would be pretty disastrous to have them, to not have the mice eliminated. But since these tombs are mainly um, elite um, households, I'm not sure if they have the same concerns or not. Mm -hmm. I also wonder, like, maybe some of these cats will have little ribbons with bells on them, which would possibly not be ideal for, for catching catching mice. So there's something about so there's something about these where I'm unsure if at least the elite use of cats is the same as the reason most Chinese peasants today would have a cat.